Welcome to A Learner's Journey. My name is Molly Sanders, and the goal of this podcast is to inspire and motivate you by connecting you with a variety of passionate horsewomen and men who have dedicated their lives to helping horses and their people. I'm grateful you're here. In this episode, you're going to get a chance to hear from a wonderful horsewoman named Courtney Crane. Courtney has been Linda Pirelli's protege for the past three and a half years. She's a gifted horsewoman who continually strives for excellence. In this interview, you'll get to hear a variety of lessons she's learned during her time with Linda. I'm really glad you've joined us. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you, Molly. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. I am so excited that you agreed to do this. One thing that I usually start with is just asking a little bit about your story. Like what's your earliest mm-hmm. memories with horses? How did you get started? That kind of, that kind of thing. Well, I've been told by my parents that I loved horses the moment I was born. Like, I don't know. And no one in my family, um, is very like horsey or, you know, into horse activities. Like they support me obviously and are very enthusiastic. So it just came from out of nowhere. You know, I wasn't born into a horse family. Um, When I was younger, I actually wanted to be a horse when I grew up. If someone asked me, what do you want to be? I would say a horse and I was dead serious. Like I I thought it was going to happen. Really? Yeah. (laughs) So I has had that. It's so crazy. Yeah. I was devastated mom told me that I couldn't be one as well. I'm like, Oh, um, so I've always loved them, but one of my earliest memories. So I grew up in North Hollywood, California, and there's a place called Griffith park and they do pony rides on the weekends. And so my parents, you know, cause we didn't have horses. They'd take me to these pony rides and you just sit on, actually they strap you onto the pony, which looking back, I'm like, that's pretty dangerous. Right. And then the ponies just go like at Liberty on this track. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe my parents did that. But I loved it. And there was a, a flea bitten pony there that I named Freckles. And I, for whatever reason, loved Freckles. And my mom would tell me stories now of when I was younger on the way to Griffith Park, I would start worrying like, do you think Freckles is going to be there today? And what if someone else is riding Freckles? And do you think they'll let me wait in line if, you know, and wait for Freckles if someone else is on her? And then what if I have to pick another pony and just That's fretting because so I love this horse. Yeah. So from the moment I was born, I just love them. And when I found out I couldn't be one when I grew up, then I started riding. <laughs> <laughs> Big disappointment. <laughs> I know. I was so disappointed. That's so great. That's so funny. So you went from riding at Griffith Park um, to uh, what, what happened next? Like you, cause you, you've been involved in competition and that yeah. kind of thing. How did, how did that come so to be? I, I, after riding pony, like doing pony rides, I think my parents found a riding stable and I just started taking lessons. So I've been taking lessons since I was like, I don't know, five maybe. And I would just go once a week and they coach me and I'd do little schooling shows. And, and then as I got older, I think we found a riding instructor that had a couple horses. And so then I would go ride her horses and my sister, I have a sister who's two years younger. She'd babysit her kids so that I could go ride with her. So it was kind of, it worked out really well. And then when I was 13, my family actually moved from um, California to Australia. And so I went to high school over there. Okay. And that's when I really got involved. I worked at a riding stable. I leased my first horse. We were supposed to go for two years, but we stayed for five. And so I ended up, um, my parents bought me my first horse in Australia wow. and the company, yeah, it was pretty crazy. And so that's when I'd always taken lessons, but that's when it really, um, expanded and I was doing more competing. I started off in eventing just lower levels. And then with the horse, my parents bought, um, I started doing dressage and he was a schoolmaster. He was actually trained to precinct George. He was a thoroughbred. So it was a great opportunity to learn. And then my dad's company, my dad was one of the first employees that went overseas to work. And so it was a little bit of new territory. We stayed for longer than expected. The family expanded because we got a dog, a bird and a horse while we were over there. Wow. And so when it was time to move back, 
the company flew our animals back. So this horse got flown back from Australia wow. to the U.S. Wow. Yeah. And actually, another funny story is he flew with the international racing transportation. So he went from Australia to a couple Asian countries and then back to the U.S. So he had like a 24-hour flight or something nuts. And then when he arrived, there was miscommunication and they didn't tell the guy transporting him where he was supposed to go, like what barn. And so we went to the barn expecting the horse to be there and he wasn't. And then no one knew where he was. So he was oh lost for like, gosh. I think I was 18 at the time. I was freaking out. My parents were like, don't worry, we'll find him. I'm like, we're never going to find him. But we ended up making some good friends in that process and, uh -huh. and found and yeah, so it's kind of kind of a crazy story. Actually. That is a crazy story. How did you end up finding him? Do you remember? So we, the guy that picked him up that was supposed to transport him, they didn't give him an address of where this horse was supposed to go. Oh my gosh! I know it's like not good communication within the company. So he took him back to his farm or his ranch, and then just waited. And so we're waiting. He's waiting, and finally. IRT kind of got their act together and figured out where this horse was supposed to go. And so he got the address, delivered the horse to us. But then the cool story is we, um, through this crazy experience, we became friends with this guy. He's kind of like a cowboy guy. Mm -hmm. um, and that horse ended up getting injured. And I couldn't, like six months after being flown to the US, he had a suspensory ligament injury. Oh, no. It was pretty bad. It couldn't be ridden again. And he ended up going back to this guy, Gary, um, to be rehabbed until he could come back to me. So it was kind of a very interesting experience that we became friends. And then he actually right. helped us with the horse later on. So, right. Wow. Yeah. So how did you end up connecting with Linda? Cause you've been, you've been her protege now for how long? Five years? Uh, three, three, three and a half. Okay. okay. <laughs> cool. That's, that's a long time. Yeah. yeah. So how did that, how did that happen? So I, um, after moving back to California, I kind of, after moving back to California and then after this horse got injured, I was pretty devastated. Like it was a pretty hard blow. Um, cause I didn't know I could, you know, just didn't know what I was going to do. So I took a break from horses for a little bit and went on and actually ended up working for a skincare company and I was a trainer and I traveled around the U S and then some parts of Canada training different stores and um, on branding. Yeah. It's That's very, interesting that you have kind of those two common pieces with Linda, the Australia piece yeah. and the skincare piece. I didn't know either one of those. Interesting. Yeah. It's funny actually when I ended up with Linda and we were talking one day, we started sharing our stories and we're like, we have a lot of similarities. Where I was in Australia was about 15 to 20 minutes where Linda kept her horses and lived too. Wow. So it was like right in the same area. And then we both worked for skincare companies in more of the education kind of sector. So yeah, it's very kind of freaky if you think yeah. about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I took a break and then I really missed it. Like I wanted to, I just, I needed a break, but then I, I really wanted to get back into horses and I had always wanted an Andalusian. Like, I just love the breed. I was like, one day I'm going to have one of these horses. I don't want, you know, thoroughbreds anymore. They're always bolting on me because I didn't mm -hmm. know how to help them then. So I got a yearling Andalusian, which I should not have bought because I had <laughs> no idea what I was doing. I've been riding my whole life. And he was looking back, he's not a very challenging, like he's medium to high spirit. So not super challenging, but at the time he was, because I didn't know anything about training a horse or psychology. Like I could just ride. That was pretty mm -hmm. much it. So he, but I wanted to do all the training myself on this horse, even though I did not know how. Uh -huh. And so that's how I found Pirelli. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was actually a lady in our area who used to be a Pirelli instructor. And so she got me on, you know, the path and playing the seven games. And I saw such fantastic results after a few years. I'm like, I want to be a pearly professional. I'm going to quit my job and, and do this instead. And so the first I signed up for a 10 week course on campus, but I'd never taken my horse who's Melly now, um, mm -hmm. the Andalusian, he was I think six or seven at the time. And I hadn't taken him anywhere since he arrived as a yearling. 
I thought, oh, I should probably take him to a clinic before I go on this 10 week adventure, you know, do a little preparation. Right. So the clinic I ended up taking him to was the emotional fitness clinic with Linda and Dr. Jenny Susser because oh, they were yeah. doing one in California, uh-huh. which is looking back, not the best setup as a first clinic because it's not your typical clinic where, you know, there's, I don't know, maybe seven or 10 riders and you're all learning together. This is you and your horse in the arena alone in front of hundreds of people. There's probably about 150 people there. Wow. So again, not the best setup, but I'm like, we can do it. And I applied and actually didn't think I'd get chosen, but then I thought, oh, well, it'll be good because I'll just go and watch, which is what I really want to do, but mm-hmm. I'll apply just to do it. Sure. And then I got chosen wow. and had to go with my, I'm like, oh my God. But that's where I met Linda for the first time. Okay. And it was really, really eye opening. She helped me a lot. So then when I, and so did Jenny, I mean, it was an amazing clinic because Linda was helping you with your horse and Jenny's helping you with you. So you just had the best of both worlds. So then when I went to my 10 week course, um, I saw Linda again. So our paths kind of kept crossing and I joke around that Melly, my Andalusian is my ticket into places because Uh everyone always remembers him. They don't remember me, which I'm totally fine with, but they remember Melly. Mm -hmm. And so she recognized him and then recognized me. So we kind of connected again. And then after, um, my 10 week course, I did a two year working student position with two four-star instructors, Maurice Tebow and Susan Nelson in California. Oh, sure. yeah. um, so I was there and then I went back to the ranch to do an externship, uh, to become a professional. And that was at Pat's barn. So I ran into Linda again while I was there. Mm-hmm. And then after my externship, I got offered a job in Wisconsin at the Horse First Farm. And that's an amazing place. Um, Carlos and Kelly own and run it. Amazing people. They have a great community there. So I could not pass it up. And in my first month there, Linda was teaching a weekend master class. And so oh. I thought, perfect. Like I'll go. I've got a job lined up. I'll get to ride with Linda and continue my education. And the weekend was amazing. I learned so much. And so at the end of the weekend, I kind of casually was like, you know, I'd love to come ride with you sometime thinking maybe in a few years, that opportunity will present itself and I'll be ready. And Linda said, that's a great idea. Like you should email me. And I thought, okay, I was not (laughs) expecting response. Right. And we started emailing and then the protege position became available. And six months later, I was in Florida at Linda's barn. That's so cool. And it, it really reminds me that, cause I've, I've talked to several people that, you know, are interested in doing what you're doing. They're interested in pursuing a professional career with mm-hmm. horses. And then maybe they have someone like Linda or, you know, a mentor that they'd be interested in studying with. And we all often tell ourselves, oh, well, I'll never get chosen. Like with the clinic, right. you know, with Jenny, yeah. like, well, I'll never do it. And oftentimes people don't even think that, you know, I, I could, I could reach out. I could, I could say, you know, tell this person what I, what I want to be doing. So it's yeah. such a good reminder for all of us to, to do that. You know, it doesn't hurt and you never know, it might be the perfect timing. And that's so cool. That's so yeah, wonderful. Absolutely. And I'm definitely one to shy away from things like that. But just like you said, I try, I try to put myself out there now. Like I try not to shy away from it because you never know what could happen. And Absolutely. even if that opportunity doesn't work out, it could open the door for something else that Absolutely. maybe is even better or what yes. you're ready for in the moment. So for sure, it's good to just, just try. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So um, you've been with Linda now for three and a half years. You've traveled all over, like you were in Colorado. Now you're in Florida and you moved from the Pirelli campus to her new place. You've seen a ton of change. Like you did not join at an easy time. <laughs> um, no. So I'm super curious, like, you know, for you, what are some of the things that have, you know, been, been lessons for you through, you know, this journey mm-hmm. with Linda being her protege? What would you, what stands out for you? Um, well, one thing that Linda says to me a lot is that perfection is overrated. Um, because I think we get into situations where we're like, hi, 
you know, you always want to do your best. And especially the students that come to study long-term like this. I mean, we're type A, you know, we want everything to be perfect and just right. And while you can strive for excellence, nothing's ever going to be perfect. And right. so that was a good, a good lesson. And then even with all the changes that you mentioned, you know, there was a lot of ups and downs and you kind of had to go with the flow and you could still strive to be the best person or make the best of the situation, but nothing is ever perfect. Right. Like things are always going to happen. And, and if you expect that, then you're kind of setting yourself up for failure because it's not going to happen. Yeah. So that was a big one. And that's my tendency. Like I'm very much a perfectionist. And so that was a hard one to kind of let go and just know that, you know, it's never going to be like that, but it's okay because things can still be really good. Right. Um, that was a big one. And then also, um, something that I think I didn't, I think maybe I knew it a little bit, but I didn't realize it would have such a profound impact on me is per, like personal development. Um, cause I knew when I was coming to study with Linda, I would get a lot with horsemanship and that's, you know, I wanted to be a great horsewoman and, and be a good teacher. But in the last year, you know, it's been, different and a little difficult at times just with all of the change. And one thing that really was a big lesson for me is how Linda handled everything because she just took it all in stride. Um, I know that, you know, at times things were difficult, but she was always positive. She always came to the barn, you know, ready to help people and not let that drag her down or affect her. And so that was really big for me as well, because in life, we're always going to have ups and downs. Um, things are going to change and happen, but it's how you handle the situation that really matters most. And you can make the best of um, any situation. And it doesn't mean that you don't feel things. Like, of course, you're going to feel different emotions. You don't want to be cold or um, emotionless, but you can not stay in that, like, that um, sad or negative place for long. Like we all have the power to change our outlook or how we're feeling or how we want to feel. And right. that's not easy. Either. Like it's still something that I'm working on. And I ask Linda a lot for tips on, but, um, but seeing her actually live that and be that example was really powerful because yeah. you can say a lot of things, but then it's one thing if you say it and another, if you do it. And I mean, she, like, she does it, like she really can turn herself around and for the better, like in any situation. So. Right. And that's one thing that I've really appreciated about her as well, because, you know, when you get to know someone um, in her position, like, you know, she's kind of in the limelight. Um, a lot of people only know her through video or like clinic situations, but when you get to be with her, I mean, you've been with her, you know, day in, day out, you know, way, way more than I have, but, you know, I've been able to be around her in situations where you are kind of, you know, behind the curtain, so to speak. And she mm -hmm. is, she is who she is in front of the curtain as she is behind, like you're saying, she walks the, the walks, the talk, and it is really inspiring to be around somebody like that. And, and you're right. It's not about like always putting on a happy face, but mm -hmm. it's about how you look at the difficult situations and, you know, what lessons can you pull out of it? How can you be better? And she's just such a great example of striving to get better and, um, and yeah. continue to have her why in the forefront mm -hmm. of helping people. And so that's, that's awesome. That's really great. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, actually, you just made me think of something else too. And this is recent, maybe in the last six months, but another big lesson I'm learning is, um, what is your outcome for things? And I think that can really help steer you on the right path. So often I'll ask Linda a question, whether it's horsemanship related or teaching, or even just like making a decision in life. And lately she's been saying to me, well, what's your outcome? Like, what kind of outcome do you want from this? And that really helps, especially if you're feeling a little undecided or a little unsure, it's given me lots of clarity of, and sometimes I don't know. And then I'm like, I need to think of well, what is my outcome with this? You know, why am I doing this? Or what am I trying to achieve? Or what am I trying to help my student achieve? And so that's been really powerful too, just to provide that clarity and plan of, you know, why would I make this decision or is it the right decision? Cause that's something I struggle with. Like 
I don't want to miss out on any opportunity. So making decisions sometimes is difficult because right. I'm a big, well, what if this, but then what if this, and then I ping pong back and forth and people are like, just make a decision, <laughs> <laughs> but that's been very helpful for me. So that's really great. Um, yeah. so I'm going to ask you a question that it's okay if you don't have an answer for, um, but I'm curious because I love that concept. And I think that's something that I'm going to, you know, be thinking about, because I think a lot of times I don't necessarily know, you know, what is, what am I looking for out of this? What is the outcome? So can you think of a, um, of a situation where you, where she asked you that, and maybe you didn't know what it was, but then you put some thought into it and figured it out. Um, recently I was actually, I asked Linda for advice on, um, talking and communicating with one of my students that I have. Um, I love this student, but we're opposite. So I'm a right brain extrovert and she's a left brain introvert. And so sometimes communicating with her is challenging because she wants the information, but then I think the way I offer it, it's not always received or listened to in the way that I think maybe it should. So it's just some communication problems. Mm -hmm. And so I was feeling a little frustrated and I'm like, you know, why do people ask questions if they don't want the answer? And I just don't understand. And Linda's like, well, what's your outcome, you know, with this conversation or with what you're trying to get across. And so for me, it just helped me take the emotion out of it. Cause I started feeling a little frustrated mm -hmm. and then I could just get a bit clear on, okay, what is my outcome? And maybe even what's her outcome of asking me these questions? Like, does she really want the answer or does she just need to bounce off information from someone? And then I can give her the information when she's ready. So it helped me take the emotion out of it. And I think a lot of times that's what that question when Linda asks me does, because I, you know, being a right brain person, I can get a little emotional of like, I don't understand or I'm frustrated or why. Right. And then I'm not being my best self because I'm letting that kind of steer my decisions versus being in a more thinking mindset and, and clear. So I love it's that. been really yeah, I'm definitely going to use that. And I love what you shared too, that it, it causes you to think about the other person, what might their outcome be? And that can completely change how you take the information in. That's yeah. really good. I like yeah. that a lot. And that's helped me a lot with, um, like, I feel like in my like horsemanship journey and my time with Linda, I'm doing really well flexing and being who I need to be for the different horses that I'm you know, training and playing with, but now the human side, I can see that I've got more growth in that area because some people are easy for me and some are a little more difficult. And I think when you can truly understand where they're coming from, it takes that frustration or emotion out of it. And so that outcome question is kind of a way that a strategy that I'm using to try and understand the other person's point of view. Cause yeah. you hear that a lot of like, well, I understand where they're coming from. And I'm like, Ah, you know, like, but why right. or I don't, I don't understand. So right. it just gives me some focus. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. I'm yeah. definitely, definitely going to use that one. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, so, um, you have, I, you know, I've, I've witnessed you and Linda together and, you, you know, riding with her during the day, her coaching you. And then after the ride, you know, you guys kind of debriefing together, you're, um, you're a talented writer, but you're also a talented learner. Like you're one of those people that's like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to learn this. Like you're so determined. Um, so, it, but as you know, we kind of have alluded to, Mm -hmm. the, the whole journey can be challenging. Learning can really be hard and it can, you know, challenge us to dig deep and pull up everything we've got to be our best. And sometimes we fall on our face. And um, so can you share a time that you were struggling as a learner and what you did to get through it? Yes, actually, it's funny you say that. Thank you so much. Cause I don't feel like I'm a good learner <laughs> sometimes because, and I think, I think I want to learn so much that I, I put a little too much pressure on it sometimes. And I feel like I can handle it. I probably really can't, but it's hard my horses because I'm like, we're going to get this. And, 
And so I've tried to tone it down a little bit. Um, the other that's, challenge that's super interesting. I just want to interject one thing that I find yeah. fascinating and you might have seen this in your journey. Um, just the, the idea that there's this dichotomy of what our strengths are, are also our weaknesses. So you've got this determination, this zest to learn. So you're driven to learn and that's such a strength, mm-hmm. but the flip side of that is it can kind of take over and be a lot of pressure on your horse. So it can also be this weakness. So I just find that fascinating. Yeah, that's a great point. Cause it's definitely a balance, um, for everyone around me, including myself. Cause I mean, it's being intense is, is great, but it can be too much at right. times, even for people. Like I've had people at the barn come up to me and say, are you okay? Are you mad at me? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm great. But I was so focused and so intense that they're reading that energy and it's, it's a little too much. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're totally right. It's like your strength can be your weakness as well. Another aspect, this was actually made apparent to me not too long ago. And I didn't even realize that I um, did this because of the situation I'm in, but a lot of my learning takes place in front of other people, whether it's being filmed or at a demo, or even just because there's other students at the barn. And it's never bothered me. Like, I feel like I can handle it. I've been in that situation, uh, that situation before. But what I didn't realize is Linda will break, um, you know, what we're doing with our horses down into three different segments. We're either learning, we're practicing what we've learned, or we're performing. And there's different, you should be in those areas at different times. And you spend the most time in the practice part and practice is boring because Mm -hmm. it's slow chipping away every day. And so what I realized actually last summer is that I was very confused about those three phases and I was in the performing state almost all the time. And I thought that was the learning state, like that pressure of performance And I also thought that was the practicing state too. And so I'm existing in this like world of pressure. My poor horse, Melly's like, you know, we're both sweating every day and it was, you know, very intense. And I'm like, well, it's hot out, but it was uh, not just the heat. Uh Um, It was the pressure on uh, both of us. And so that was a huge lesson for me as a learner is that learning is hard, but then you shouldn't have this pressure all the time. And I think- as I'm, you know, a little more like my learning is a little more public than most people. I got immune to that pressure and it was too much for me and my horse. And I had to really like take a step back and, and understand, you know, what does practice feel like? And it's not always this intense, you know, feeling every time I'm riding or I'm training, like it can be a little bit more relaxed and more slow. And we don't have to do the 50 million things I have on my list that I want to accomplish today. You know, it can be two things. So that was a big lesson um, for me. And I, I mean, looking back, I've had a lot of times where I've struggled as a learner. I think a big one that actually you've partly witnessed and that I'm still in is trying to get flying changes. And so as I advance. Um, and it's funny because, I mean, I've seen this with students, but then when it's with yourself, it's always, you know, sometimes you don't see it, right. but in the beginning you make progress really quickly because you're learning new skills and things just flow really fast. But then as you advance, uh, your progress is slow and you chip away at it. And that's been as a learner hard for me. Cause I'm like, I should have it by now. And I'm comparing myself to other people, which you should never do. And so then I start adding that pressure back in of like, and I never feel like quitting, but it gets too intense. Or the other thing is I feel frustrated with myself. I don't often feel frustrated with my horse, but I'm pretty Mm self-critical. And so I'll get frustrated and I'll get a bit upset, but then my horse can't read that energy. He doesn't know where it's directed to. And so it's just not a positive place for either of us. Right. So that's kind of been a struggle as a learner. It's like, I want something so bad. I'm going to make it happen, but you can't make things happen. Like they happen right. when you're ready and prepared and, right. and it will fall into place eventually. And yeah. Linda tells me 
when I get really upset, she's like, you never, you didn't see my years of struggle. And I'm like, and in my head, I go, yeah, right. I'm sure it wasn't years of struggle. And, right. and she can tell on my face that I don't believe her. And she's like, I'll pull out video. I'll show you, you know, when I was trying <laughs> to do shoulder in or a flying change, because when you see, you know, someone who's advanced or expert, it looks so easy. And then you try and do it and it's hard. And Right. Right. Well, and it's so great to hear you talk about this because anyone that has seen you with, um, with Meili or, you know, any other horses, but riding him, you guys are such a beautiful partner, you know, such a beautiful pair. And it does look effortless, you know, to <laughs> me and to, you know, other people, you, you are at a level where it's, it's so, um, impressive to watch and it looks it, you do make it look easy. So I think it is helpful for people to hear that, uh, no, you still have to go through, you know, the challenging stuff. And, you know, like you're talking about the, the frustration of the, the minuscule learning, the little tiny bits, incremental bits, whereas in the beginning it's this, you know, exciting, you're learning a lot. So that's really cool. It's a great, it's a great reminder. I also wanted to say that, um, what you're talking about of the three parts of, um, what you should be doing with your horse. Yeah. Linda, I did a, uh, my very first podcast interview was with her and oh, she cool. shared, she shared a little bit about a conversation that you guys had just had. Oh, how and funny. she was watching you and, um, May Lee and, uh, it, and it was that day that you guys were totally sweating and you were like, you know, this is hard. And she's like, this is practice. It shouldn't be. So she explains those three pieces really well. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, um, I'll put a link to that podcast too. Oh, that's awesome. They can, yeah. And, they can learn and that was huge. Like for all the students at the barn during that time, it was really eye opening for us. Cause it's like, what, what state are you in? Because you shouldn't like learning is hard and you should only be in that state when you're learning something new and then you're practicing it and performing only happens every once in a while, but it's very easy to get confused between yes. the, the three. So it is. that's very cool. That, that would be a good one to listen to. Yeah. Me. And I think, you know, I'm thinking as, as you're talking about this, it's such a great reminder too, because, you know, you can listen to something or learn something, hear something, and then think you have it. And, you know, oh, I don't need to, I don't need to listen to that again. And time goes on and you, you forget about it and you go back to your old ways and the things that are comfortable. So it'd be a good, good thing for me to listen to again um, as well. So really yeah. cool. Um, so you have um, been really instrumental in helping Linda put together this new curriculum. I know that because I've seen behind the scenes. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, it's a huge undertaking, you know, mm -hmm. basically putting together her life's work and, mm -hmm. um, it's really exciting. You've done several books now with her, which yeah. is, you know, people get to see the finished product. And I don't know if everyone realizes what a gargantuan undertaking it is and, you know, how cool it is that people now have access to this work that you've done, but you've put a lot of work into it. Um, so what could you tell us, like, what do you, what do you love about what's coming out? What do you love about the curriculum that you're helping with? Honestly, everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, so, uh, I'm so excited because what, and I didn't even really know or understand this when Linda was first putting it all together. And I was so fortunate to be in meetings and like, you know, see the thought process behind creating something like this. Um, and also, you know, contribute ideas as well. But what I'm, what I'm finding that what I'm finding very successful, like for myself and my students and really anyone who can get their hands on it is that, you know, when you've created something, you always look back and think, okay, well, what would I do differently? Or how could I make it better? Mm -hmm. And Linda now had an opportunity to, you know, after 30 plus years of teaching and just creating um, information for people to learn and absorb. And I mean, that's really Linda's, I mean, she's an amazing teacher and she's amazing at taking information, complicated information and making it simple and putting it into a system and making it easy for anyone to understand. 
And so with all of that years of experience, now that she's putting this together, it's so straightforward. It's so um, easy to understand in terms of problem solving. So the results that we're seeing with students, whether they take one of Linda's master classes or even just followed online or even how I'm you know, teaching it out in the field, I mean, people are achieving results so fast. Their horses are happy, connected, relaxed. The people are happy, connected to their horses, relaxed. I mean, it's just amazing. And I think it, it comes down to just knowing, you know, after all those years, like what's needed, like what are going to be the most impactful things that we can tell people or educate people on so they can go home and use it and see real results with it. So, I mean, it's been so exciting. And what I'm loving is that the first thing that we teach people is connection, which seems like, um, second nature of like, you know, of course we need to have connection with our horse. We want connection with other people, but when you really think about it, how do you do that? Right. Like, how do you get connection with an animal? Right. Yeah. And I think all of the, you know, um, famous horsemen out there, like they know how to do it innately, but to teach something like that, mm -hmm. it's a pretty challenge. And the way Linda's broken it down and been able to explain it to people it sets you up for success. Like all of the clinics um, or the master classes that I've been able to assist her with since she created this curriculum, the horses, I mean, within, before the lunch break, all the horses are connected. No one's, you know, on adrenaline running around. Everyone's having success. It happens so quickly. And I think it's wow. that connection piece. Like yeah. I really think that the, almost like the secret weapon or, or you know, what's different is that you're starting with connection and you're making people aware of how important it is and how to get it. Cause I think a lot right. of people don't even know how to get that. And it's important for the students because they have to be the kind or become the kind of person that their horse can connect to and wants right. to connect to as right. well. So yeah. like, that's the other half of the puzzle. So it's pretty big, but it's easy as well. Like it's not hard. It's not this long study that you have to do you, if you can, adjust a few things or recognize a few behaviors, anyone can achieve it. And then your relationship is going to be so much stronger with your horse, more powerful. And now you can start taking away at all the problems or things you want to fix or the goals you want to achieve because you're connected. So That's it's really, really cool. Exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. And something else I really like about what she's doing is so people can, um, they can purchase the, the curriculum, but they need to be members of the, of her membership. And mm -hmm. I love that that is part of it because, um, the membership is so robust and active. I mean, you guys are in there, you're in there and people can watch the material and then ask questions and share yeah. what they're doing. And it's mm -hmm. such a great combination so, yeah. um, and I'll make sure that there's links for people, you know, if they're interested in learning more about the curriculum, they can find out about it because it yeah. is it's such a wonderful thing that you guys are doing. Yeah. There's a lot of support, which is great because yeah. some people are really lucky to have instructors close to them. And a lot of, um, instructors, myself included, like we do things virtually as well, because, you know, you might be in an area where there's not an instructor, but just the sense of community with everyone on there. I mean, people are not afraid to jump on and voice their opinion or ask a question or share an experience. And all of that's so helpful because we can all learn from each other, you know, based on different experiences or what we've gone through or what we've learned from other people or instructors. So the community part is very, um, it's a real integral piece of it as well. Like the curriculum is amazing for solving problems, helping you achieve your goals with your horse, no matter what it may be. But then that community um, is another big piece because mm -hmm. there's a lot of support. You feel very connected. You're not alone. People are going through the same thing. Right. You can create different groups on the membership site. Like I think there's a left brain introvert survivors forum where oh, people can go ideas. And then there's like a, a recipe one. So, I mean, it's just really, it's cool. It's very cool to be able to connect with people. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been, it's just been helpful for, for students as well. Yeah. That's really cool. So you have a new horse, you've had him for what, over a year now? 
Yes. I've had him for time flies. I've had him for a year and a half. Okay. Now. He just turned two in March. Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And you're, you're, you, did you put, you put the first ride on him just recently? I did. Yeah. So I've had, um, six rides. Actually the sixth ride was at our members conference that just happened, um, last weekend wow. and he, he's pretty young. So wow. the rides are just a couple minutes and it's mostly passenger with a little guiding, just bareback, mm -hmm. you know, just getting him used to carrying someone on his back. But yes, I've done um, all the training myself with a lot of Linda's guidance mm -hmm. because he is a very challenging horse. Um, right. But yeah. So, and he, if I, I don't, I, I haven't met him, but I've seen little clips and snippets and he seems uh -huh. like he's super playful. He's into everything. He's, you yeah. know, he's fat, fast with his mind and his body. Um, so what would you say, like, what has made the, or what, what makes the difference with him? What, what do you have to do in yourself to be a good leader for him? Oh, that is a really, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, because that has been what I've been learning for the last year and a half. So when I, so he comes from the same breeder as Melly, but they're not related. So he's an Andalusian as well. And I, a couple years ago, I kind of started about, you know, thinking about getting a new horse. So I was tentatively looking and I always look at the babies that are born at this stud every year because I just really like the horses that Terry breeds. Um, and she's become a good friend over the years as well. And so uh, two years ago, the first foal of 2020 was Yuri, who's my horse now. And I saw a picture of him at 12 hours old, kind of looking back at the camera with this really mischievous look. And I thought, ooh, maybe this is my next super horse. And um, I met him when he was four months. And I knew, and I had actually had a shopping list, which was an, ad, um, some advice Linda gave me, which I highly recommend for people because horse shopping can be kind of a crazy experience. So I had a list of what I wanted or what I was looking for. And then I knew on that list, what was non-negotiable and then what was negotiable because I was going to this stud farm. There's all these cute babies. It's so easy to just fall in love with one. And then maybe it turns out not to be the right horse for you. So I was really clear of like, this is what I'm looking for. And I knew when I met him that he was high spirited, but I underestimated how high spirited he was. Mm -hmm. And honestly, looking back, I should have known because I mean, he would canter off and leave his mother and like disappear out of sight. Didn't care. <laughs> I mean, so bold, so brave, so smart. So it was a good lesson in like spirit, like reading spirit level um, for me. But when I got him uh, home and actually we picked him up on our move from Colorado to Florida. So I spent a couple days at um, Herodura Andalusians, which is where he's from, getting to know him, prepping him to load. And I mean, he was a piece of cake because he mm -hmm. loves adventure. And then he was on the road with us for five days as a six month old, but he wow. did great. And so then when I got him back and started playing with him, um, very quickly, I realized this horse is more than I bargained for. And I mean, mm -hmm. I was in love with him and I, mm -hmm. I don't regret it at all. And there was one time, um, where I was really struggling and I was having a hard time and I was kind of starting to feel down on myself of like, man, I'm, I'm not, I must not be very good. Cause I'm really struggling with this horse and, you know, things aren't going well. And Linda could see I was having a hard time and she took me aside and she said, look, in the 30 plus years I've been around horses, she's like, he's in the top 10% in terms of intelligence, spirit level. I mean, he is, this is not your typical horse. So like, don't beat yourself up. Like it's a great learning opportunity. Right. Um, so he's very, very challenging and he's an, he's probably the smartest horse I've ever encountered. I mean, he's really like a genius, pretty mm -hmm. much. He can figure anything out. So what's been challenging is like, um, coming back to your original question, being that leader, because I, and, and it's still a work in progress, but I did not know how to be the kind of leader he needed. And even more importantly, the kind of leader he would choose to follow right. because he's really looking to follow anybody. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a big journey. And actually, um, there's one, like, I think this was about a year ago. I was 
I, vet prep was very difficult with him. Um, like anything with needles, he would really fight it. And so that was a huge, uh, struggle that I had and a huge thing to overcome. So I worked mm -hmm. really hard on it and now he's great. I must say like, he just got his Coggins and he stood there and he was perfect. The reason why, um, it was so difficult is because I was not the leader he needed. So we could kind of get along, but then when I needed to accomplish something, he'd pull the plug and then I had nothing. So one night Linda and I were talking and I was asking a lot of questions about leadership and Yuri and, and what I needed to do. And I'm trying to think, I don't even really remember how it started, but she basically started a simulation with me where she was Yuri mm -hmm. and she just attacked me <laughs> and started biting me with her fingers, like biting right. me and like going for my legs. And I didn't know what to do. And so I start defending myself, which made her want to bite me more. And uh -huh. long story short, Linda didn't stop. And this is exactly what I needed at the moment, but I didn't realize it. Uh -huh. Linda did not stop until I achieved the, um, the leadership and the intention that I needed. And this simulation went on for more than two hours. Molly. What? It was, yeah. It was so long because I finally, because, and she wasn't really giving me any hints. It was like, figure it out. Like it's a, you know, do or die kind of thing. Like uh -huh. you've got to figure this out for this mm -hmm. horse. So she was attacking me and biting me and, and just basically being like my horse. And at first I defend myself, which made her want to bite me even more. And then I kind of start like fighting back a little bit and that made her want to attack me even more. And it was funny when we were talking about it afterwards, because she said, it was interesting because when you did all the wrong things, it was fun. Like I wanted to bite you and I wanted to attack you. It was like this game. Uh -huh. And so finally I found this very grounded feeling where I could create a boundary and not let her in. Mm -hmm. And it would last for a couple seconds and then she'd bite me again. And uh -huh. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And, and eventually what I figured out and what the answer was after two plus hours is that not only did I need to create that boundary that she couldn't penetrate, but then I had to redirect her because when I finally found the, the feeling and the intention of, you know, stop, you can't bite me. She would stop, but then I wouldn't do anything. We'd just be right. staring at each other. So a couple uh -huh. moments would pass and then she'd go in for me again. So it was like, I had to create that, that plan, that leadership mm -hmm. and then redirect her. And it had to be fun and playful too. It couldn't be like too stern because then that made you know, her or the horse want to attack or bite even more. Right. So I think the reason why it took me so long and it was so hard is because that's not the kind of person I am. And right. actually the next morning when I woke up, I felt physically sick from the simulation because it took so much out of me to find that place. And like, it took a lot for me to rise up to be that leader because it's just, it's hard to explain, but it, it, it's just innately not who I am. And maybe for other people, it would have been easier. Yeah. And, um, the next morning I went out to feed all the horses and Yuri, when he would see me, and I thought this was connection in the beginning, but it's not when he would see me, like I'd come out of the house or the barn and he'd clock me and he'd watch my every move. Mm -hmm. And I thought, look how connected he is. Like he loves me, but uh -huh. really he's like, he is, there's the weakest link. And so he was like watching me. And then I'd come through the gate into the pasture and he'd march up like here she is. And again, I thought, oh, he's connected, but he'd mm -hmm. be coming into my face and too close. And so after that fateful night with the simulation, I woke up the next morning feeling sick. And then I was like, okay, I can do this. And I walk out and Yuri sees me and he starts coming up. And I just found that energy. It's almost like a very grounded kind of feeling. And he stopped dead in his tracks and looked at me like, oh, you're different today. And Melly, my other horse, who's much more sensitive, he felt the energy come from me and he spun around and galloped off. He was so freaked out because for him, it's way too much. Like right. He doesn't need that kind of um, leadership. Right. So it's... Um, it's still a work in progress with Yuri because he tests me almost every day, yeah. but it's really, um, it's really having a plan and, and being able to match him. And I think that's what I was trying to explain is that matching him is very uncomfortable for me because right. it takes so much intensity. Right. And that's not 
what I'm used to and not innately who I am. And so that's what I had to find that night with Linda is how to match him in a playful way that I can direct. Right. And, and that was a big, a big turning point. And what's also interesting is after that night, people that I hadn't seen in a while, if they came to visit the barn or I would hang out with them after an hour or so, they would say, you're different. And they're like, I don't know how, but you're different. And, and I don't know if it was like just this more grounded way of being or the way I was directing myself. I'm, I'm not totally sure to be honest, but right. people like other people noticed too. And I wasn't even trying to be that way. Yeah. Um, and then another, I know this is a super long answer, but another interesting thing that happened was at the conference a week, um, last weekend, one of the sessions we did was the story of Yuri. Mm -hmm. And so I was in there, um, with a microphone presenting and I had Melly and Yuri with me and I was just telling his story and what I've learned. And I was really nervous for it because I told him I said, I can't hold him and talk to people at the same time because mm -hmm. it's still too much for me to multitask and manage. Like when I'm with him, I have to be 100% focused right. and he's not dangerous or anything, but he's, there's a lot going on in his brain. And so I really right. have to stay on top of it. And Linda said, don't worry, like you can turn him loose and he'll be, you know, away from you. And then you can talk. And I was like, okay, I, I hope I can pull this off. Mm -hmm. But what was fascinating is when I was telling his story, I was embodying that energy and that, you know, leadership and, um, just that way of being. And then there were two times during that session where Linda interjected something, or I asked Linda a question. And when Linda started talking, Yuri started coming closer to me. Like he recognized, cause what happened was, and I didn't realize this at the time, but when Linda started talking, my energy changed. And mm -hmm. I almost went into this more submissive kind of way of being. Cause my mentor, like I'm listening, I've directed everything back to her. Right. And he read it like that. And, and it was funny cause they played the Jaws music during the oh. seminar. So I loved it. But That's he, funny. I mean, in instant, he recognized it and started getting closer. And okay, so I, I just have to share one thing. Um, and I don't know if this fits, mm -hmm. but, and, it, you know, I was thinking it when you were talking earlier about what the simulation with you and Linda, and then when you just shared this additional story of when she'd get up and start talking, mm -hmm. as you're talking about creating this energy, to me, it, it sounded like you know, you're someone that you, you make space for people. And mm -hmm. again, like that's a, I think that's a strength for, of yours. You're, you're very easy to be around. You're very comfortable to be around. And I think that, you know, like when people come to the barn, you're, you're recognizing them, you're making space for them. Mm -hmm. But with Yuri, you make space for him and he's like game on. Right. Oh, yeah. So You're it's right. like you had to make space for, you had to create space for yourself mm -hmm. like and these really clear boundaries. So, and then I thought about that again, when you were talking about presenting, you're, you're, you know, you're, you've created this space, you're sharing the story, you've got the microphone. And then when Linda comes in, you're making space for her. Right. Right. And Yuri goes, yes. woohoo. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Actually, I haven't thought of it that way before, but I think you're absolutely right. And then when I created that space for Linda, he, and, and it's also, I think when I have him with me and someone asks me a question or I, I talk to somebody and I've had to say as politely as I can, when I'm with him, if someone talks to me, it's like, I'll get back to you in a moment. I, I have to focus right now because the moment I take my focus away or create that space for somebody he just goes, he takes advantage. Like he yeah. goes right in and he's not trying to be bad. Like that's just who he is. I right. mean, he, his bubble is inside of him. Like mm -hmm. he's just so interactive, right? but it tur quickly turns into him taking over and then, right. you know, a whole bunch of other things, but yeah, that's a really good way of, of putting it. And so that's been a huge, that was, that's been a very big lesson. Um, I mean, I'm so thankful for him. I, it's funny because I go out and teach students now and I constantly am like, thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Yuri. Or thank you, Linda. Cause I'll see little things that I wouldn't have seen before. Or I'm aware of, you know, when horses are starting to be a little too dominant or pushy or 
person's, you know, intention isn't right. Or like, I'm seeing so much more now because of all these experiences that I've had with him just from a year and a half. But, um, I mean, he's definitely the most challenging horse I've ever worked with totally above my skill level, but I'm working really hard to catch up to him. Um, but he's a, he's for sure a super horse and super learner and so cool. And so many yeah. people like you're even, you know, talking about that students, you're seeing things that you wouldn't have before mm -hmm. him, you know, it's, uh, so many people are going to learn so much more because of him, because of the things that you're yeah. learning with him. So that's yeah, really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, what's, what's next for you? Like, are you, do you have plans for the, for the future yet? Are you going to be with Linda for a while longer and continue? Um, cause you're teaching now people can come and learn with you. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm teaching. Um, it's actually really fun. We do. Um, so I'm operating out of Linda's place, happy horse Haven in um, Williston, Florida, and we'll do theme days once a month where we just had one that was called ride in ride out. So we rode in the arena and outside the arena and talked about like the different benefits and how to have the same leadership in the arena and outside because sometimes it can change. So yeah, so I'm teaching lessons, clinics, doing theme days. Um, so that's really exciting. And I love getting out there and like sharing all of this with people. Like I just find it so motivating and, and are you traveling? Are you traveling? Like, can people bring you places or are you staying close to yeah. at this point? No, I, I do travel. I'm actually going to California at the end of May and then Vermont in June. Um, and I think North Carolina in July. Great. So I don't do a ton, but like if someone wants me to come, like it's definitely a possibility. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, any is a possibility really. And, right. but then as far as the future, I don't, I don't know. I'm still kind of figuring it out. Um, I just finished a huge manual, um, that I co-did with Linda. It's, it turned out way bigger than what I thought, but I'm so excited. It's actually, uh, launching very soon. It's a trailer loading manual Oh, I saw and that. it's everything. Yeah. Everything and anything you need to know there's volume one and volume two, so that's kind of reaching conclusion, which is exciting. And then, yeah, I'm just kind of getting Yuri started. And I did a couple, actually one competition with Melly a couple months ago, which was fun. So I'm kind of toying with the idea of maybe doing more and, but yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm just letting pieces fall into place and starting to think about, you know, what am I going to do? And and where am I going to be and how much longer am I going to stay? And, mm -hmm. and, but I mean, I'll certainly stay involved because I just love what I'm doing here with Linda and, and the curriculum and happy horse, happy life. And I find it so, um, inspiring and rewarding to help people, you know, whether I'm teaching them in person or answering questions on the membership site. Um, I love, I think one of the things that motivates me the most is seeing people's success with their horses and achieve goals and just, you know, make those breakthroughs. And so that's something that I'll definitely, you know, continue to be involved in and, and continue to do with Linda. So that's awesome. Very, Very cool. Yeah, yeah. It's super exciting. Um, and how, how can people connect with you if they want to learn um, more with you? So you can connect with me. Um, I do have a web page. It's uh, courtneycrane.com. And, uh, also on happy horse, happy life through Facebook, uh, my emails on all of those sites too. So people can Great. email me if they want as well, but, um, yeah, really anyway, I love to connect with people. Okay. Awesome. And I'll make sure that that's all in the notes for people. Um, so they can connect with you. Oh, thank um, you. So thank you so much. It's been so fun to hear more about you. I learned a ton and I think people are really going to benefit from listening to this. So. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Molly. I was very excited when you extended the invitation. Um, I've always loved all of the things that you put out there and I find you very easy and fun to talk to. So thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you. That wraps up my interview with Courtney. I hope you found a bunch of tidbits to help you on your journey. If you enjoyed this, please take a moment to share it and make sure you follow or subscribe to hear more. I'm grateful you tuned in. Have a wonderful rest of your day.